seven months. Uh, prior to that, I was in uh, uh, here in Texas for uh, 19 years, working for the Nature Conservancy. And so uh, it's good to be back. The, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to talk about a project that the Louisiana chapter of the Nature Conservancy has uh, uh, been working on, working toward since about 2005. The uh, historical extent of prairie in Louisiana, you know, what's it count? I've got the expert right here, so he can correct me. It's about two million acres. Now we're around a thousand acres. So obviously we're in a very, uh, we, we don't have a lot to work with. If you just look at the lower right hand corners, kind of like what Larry and, and uh, Dr. Padrine mentioned this morning, this is kind of the core of where we're working at, the scale we're working at, is trying to use these remnants as, as lifeboats to uh, recover this system in Louisiana. The, uh, as I, I lost my uh, advancer here. Uh, one thing I was going to mention is that, uh, you know, I've been, you know, moving uh, to Louisiana, I had to really look for uh, some real estate, and uh, it was really hard because my wife, you know, had particular interest in what she wanted to find. I wanted to find some property, waterfront property, had a lot of values to me, wildlife, and, and so on, but, uh, you know, I, I proposed something to my wife uh, in terms of what property I wanted. I found this place, a little fixer-upper, multi-level, waterfront property, uh, but she didn't really go for it. And, Neither did my kids. I had a couple of my boys right here. They didn't uh, want to live here. A lot of fringe benefits there. We, we could uh, definitely uh, have a lot of fun in that prop and something like that. But anyways, the, uh, the mission of the Nature Conservancy is one of its strengths, and that is it hasn't changed. Hopefully it won't uh, change substantially, and that is protect the, uh, preserve the plants and animals and communities that represent the diversity of life on Earth by protecting the lands and the waters that need to survive. And in terms of prairie in Louisiana, you know, I, of course, I've kind of come coming from a more of a wetland, a waterfowl background. Uh, my interest, I like to look at, you know, consider prairie in Louisiana historically as uh, as wetland landscape interspersed with prairie. Dr. Vadrine would say this is prairie interspersed with wetlands, but uh, <laughs> it, it integrates. Right. It's a beautiful. But it, the, the prairies in Louisiana are, you know, if you look, if you look at the, some historical context, is really incredible. And in fact, there's some recent work that's showing that the extent of prairies is probably much greater than even it's, it's been documented thus far. Prairies up in areas that we, we never thought of, areas, inclusion areas up and around the Delta, north, uh, east Louisiana. But Colonel Lockett, uh, and I'm not going to read the quote here. During her, his survey of the state of uh, Louisiana, he visited every parish in the state. He was a, actually a Civil War hero. And uh, he started uh, the survey, he had a colleague of his, uh, uh, oh, I forget his name, you probably remember Dr. Verdrine, but uh, he got sick, and so Colonel Lockett had to do it all on his own. He ended up coming up with a report on sort of the, uh, the state of Louisiana in terms of, a lot more in terms of natural history than what, uh, frankly, he was trained for, but he did a great job. And you can see he highlighted the importance of a prairie in Louisiana and his thoughts and really, you know, look at it as a loveliest part of Louisiana. And I think uh, we'd all agree. Yeah, water prairie ticket. I mean, many of the elements of the prairie, uh, since the prairie has gone into decline, we've lost many of the species that relied upon it. The Atwater prairie chicken was extirpated in 1919. And frankly, right now, it would be hard to envision, you know, and based on my experience in that water prairie chicken conservation here in, in Texas, it, it's kind of hard to envision a landscape large enough right now where we could conceivably reintroduce that water prairie chickens. That water prairie chickens require minimum core grassland blocks of 20,000 acres. 
with viable corridors to other 20,000, you know, at least two other 20,000 acre blocks. At least that's how it outlined, it's been outlined in the uh, Atwater Prairie Chicken Recovery Plan. We just don't have anything like that in Louisiana right now. The whooping crane, a lot of people don't realize it, but the whooping crane is uh, historically uh, a resident of Louisiana, not just a resident, a breeding, there was a breeding population of whooping cranes in the White Lake marshes and grasslands of Vermilion Parish. And uh, we're pretty excited that now, after all these years of having been extirpated, the uh, whooping crane has returned to Louisiana. We had a release of, in the neighborhood, of about 14 or 15 birds. Unfortunately, recently a couple Yahoo kids shot a couple of them, but uh, there's going to be more released in the spring, and there's a lot of confidence that uh, this whooping crane population will come back. And of course, they historically were trade out between the wetland and grassland prairie complex uh, in Vermilion Parish and, and beyond. So uh, we're very hopeful on that count. So it's not all bad news. Red wolf is obviously a, uh, a species uh, you know, tied to the prairies of uh, southwest Louisiana as well as uh, uh, southeast Texas. It has been extirpated, although certainly a lot of folks report this uh, coyotes every year there's that that show up that they call red wolf uh, with red wolves in, in Louisiana they get calls to the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries saying I saw a red wolf but I'm sure there's DNA that's still in those coyotes but uh, we don't have any pure red wolf bison's been documented throughout the state of uh, many most parishes in Louisiana and of course grassland birds that we heard about this morning uh, very important. The uh, millarks and then quail, henslow sparrows, and so on. Uh, speaking about how, you know, it's the same story we've already heard today in many of the other presentations. The demise of coastal prairie in Louisiana came at uh, primarily uh, due to agricultural conversion. And after the, uh, after World War I, uh, a lot of this conversion really took off in a big way with mechan uh, uh, mechanized agriculture and also the growth of the railroad system in Louisiana. Here's a, there was a, a thesis that I read from about 1963 by a gentleman who chronicled the, the growth of the rice industry in Louisiana. And I kind of picked up this one quote that, they, that some of the, uh, that the state and, and others, land developers, you know, were looking at. They wanted people to come into Louisiana. They wanted to grow this industry for agriculture. Great soils, great climate, and great infrastructure for doing that. They call it Southwest Louisiana, the land where nature smiles. And I, I just, uh, I don't know how much you smile, you know. It, it, I, I kind of picked up on that quote, but agriculture certainly has been a key part of the uh, history of the Louisiana coastal prairies and uh, I'll mention more about it as well. One of the first people that I uh, spent time in the field with when I came to Louisiana was Larry Alon. Larry, Dr. Vidrini, have been working in Louisiana prairies for many years and it's just not the biological aspects of the prairie that, that is very interesting and, and uh, compelling, but it's sort of the social uh, and the historical context of the, of the Cajun prairie, to call it. Here is uh, Dr. Padrine's publication here. Uh, Larry's uh, work in Louisiana is, is highly valuable. And, and a lot of people don't realize the historical context of uh, cattle industry in Louisiana. Very large. I mean, if you ever heard of the Great Ranch in Louisiana, it's one of the largest ranches, contiguous ranches in, in the world. Uh, and this is just vast, open, big country grasslands uh, where, where cattle ranged uh, all the way from Bagatesh all the way to Johnson Bayou, uninterrupted. So where are we at in terms of what do we have to work with uh, in terms of uh, prairie? Uh, obviously, 
when you think about the biodiversity continuum in terms of how to you, how can you uh, create effective conservation at these different scales, uh, at least for the Nature Conservancy, historically, it was down here. We established, you know, several hundred acre preserve, protect the rare plant populations or community representation that was on that on that property and then move on to the next one. But obviously over time the conservancy and everybody else in the conservation biology world has considered that for long term viability we need to be looking and working upwards in this pyramid. And we need to be looking at how can we effectively conserve larger landscapes that embed these very important small patch uh, communities. And so when you talk about the number for you know the scattered remnants in Louisiana, a thousand acres, we need to be thinking about how can we affect maybe not just maybe not prairie restoration because as uh, Doug Gladman says more, it's not may not be what we consider. You know, each of us has an idea of what true prairie is about, but it may be some some semblance of that. You know, what I would call more of a grassland structure just to get something established. And so, because we want to be able to have these, these areas uh, resilient to future uh, disturbances, such as invasive species and, and, and hydrological alterations, and we want to be able to have fire uh, that's applied to be effective at the scale in which, you know, those, those prairie uh, representations would occur. If you cannot burn, for example, you know, a 50 acre site, you can burn it, but if that's all you have left, it may not be the smartest thing to burn, 50, you know, just one single 50 acre patch when that's all you have. And so that's basically where we're at in terms of, you know, we're looking at management to scale. As uh, Larry mentioned this morning, uh, the Nature Conservancy of Louisiana has been working with the U uh, Union Pacific Railroad um, to essentially lease these prairie remnants along railroad right-of-ways. Uh, when I got to Baton Rouge and started learning more about this program from some of our other folks like Richard Martin, I was astounded that the railroad, this multi-billion dollar industry, would even bother was having to require the Nature Conservancy to pay for the right to, to manage these prairie remnants along the railroad right-of-ways. It just seemed, uh, I don't know, just, just didn't make sense to me. But that's what we have to deal with. These have been invaluable in terms of preserving the genetic seed stock of the, of the Cajun prairie. So that kind of led us to thinking about what, what tools are out there. How can we implement existing uh, opportunities and methodologies that may permit a semblance of a, of a large-scale grassland conservation effort in the state of Louisiana? And that led us to CREP, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. I'm not going to read all this. You all can, can read it. But CREP is specifically geared to address priority conservation issues of national significance, water supplies, threatened and endangered wildlife species, and so on. It's community-based, results-oriented, and, uh, and so in 2005, my colleagues with the Louisiana chapter, along with other partners, uh, had it started a conversation with the state Natural Resources Conservation Service, as well as the Farm Services Administration, about trying to implement a prairie crop in the state of Louisiana. Another issue that is certainly commonly uh, talked about in, in Louisiana is the Gulf Hypoxic Zone. And so this is another element that sort of ties to that description of crop, looking at ways to reduce nutrient. Obviously, you can't compare a you know, eight uh, parish region in Louisiana to make a huge difference, but it is one piece of the conversation in terms of trying to reduce uh, nutrient runoff and causing, uh, you know, the acceleration or the expansion of the hypoxia zone. 
This map represents, and it's kind of hard to see, but these little tiny polygons scattered throughout Cameron, Jefferson, Davis, Acadia, Paris, and so on, are identified prairie remnants that remain in these, this region of Louisiana. These are the areas that's generally there that we wanted to be able to apply the CREP uh, methodology to. Looking at as small as they are, maybe looking at those as sort of small anchor points throughout this eight parish region around which, working with private landowners, we could see a real meaningful scaling up of grassland conservation in, in these areas. So we came up with uh, cooperation again with partners and NRCS and FSA defined a 842,000-acre region covering portions of eight parishes in southwest, south-central Louisiana, upon which this is what constituted our prairie prep project delineation zone. So, I'll read that. Just some of the basic concepts that we wanted to, to be able to implement through, through the prairie crab. Restoration, you know, we talk about diverse native grasslands. Obviously, that's going to be a function of seed availability and so on. And so that's why I, I kind of go back to what I already mentioned, is looking at ways that we can at least get a start in terms of uh, planting, uh, getting a grassland structure established and then building up from there. It may not, it's not going to be a super diverse, we're not talking about a Nash Prairie, we're not talking about a Kansas Prairie here, or these high diverse uh, sites, it's just not practical. But what is possible is at least an anchor, an anchor grass plant site upon which we can build. So here what we're talking about is for the Nature Conservancy was especially interested in what we call the diverse grassland plantings, and uh, they were talking to have a goal of 2,500 acres. And when I say diverse, you think about six species, you normally don't think about that as being highly diverse, but that's essentially what we're looking at. And then about three to four species to establish in terms of uh, 11,000 acres. That, this is a CP25. Anybody from NRCS here? You can, okay, you can correct me on my practices if I, if I get them wrong. But this is a uh, the highly diverse grassland practice is CP25. This one, the shallow water uh, stem, I think, is CP9. And then the uh, native grass uh, practice, I believe, is CP3, if I'm not mistaken. So this runs the, gives it an outline of the payments for these different practices. Also, there's, there's also funding for mid practice. Uh, management uh, needs as well, whether it might be invasive control, uh, potentially fire application, etc. So what do you, what's a landowner get? Why would a landowner be interested in the prairie crop in Louisiana? Well, geared up towards what the interim payment. In this area, it's almost exclusively rice agriculture. So there, right now, we're looking at 150% of average return on rental payments. That comes out to $77 an acre. They would get 50 to 100%, depending on the specific practice of the cost share. You also get an incentive sign-up bonus, or, or payment, I should say bonus. Uh, and of course, you get technical support that guides the restoration. And then uh, there's a potential also for additional income. If they were interested in perhaps uh, selling carbon rights on their property, that may be a possibility where you could, or a, or a, uh, a purchase or a sale uh, from landowner of their perpetual easement on a tract, that would be something that the Nature Conservancy may be interested in as, as well. Is looking at landowner, what are they getting through their uh, CR, or their CREP payment, it only goes on for 15 years, and so beyond that, that's a big question. What happens to those grasslands following the 15-year contract period? 
And so that's a big part. They're also maybe interested in doing, you know, uh, obviously we would hope that would elevate the recreational hunting uh, values of their property. There may be some other values that could accrue that would uh, maintain those acres in, in grassland. So landlord responsibilities is implement the restoration plan as developed, no alteration of the acreage, and then again the 15-year term of the uh, of the crop agreement. The the goal acreage goal is uh, 15,500 acres right now. Unfortunately, initially when we were initially uh, we are talking about doing this, it was a much larger number. We are talking about almost 30,000 acres. The whole effort, as I mentioned, this discussion on this started in about 2005. And, you know, there's certainly Nature Conservancy has its share of bureaucracy. I'm sure you guys can test the NRCS, FSA, we all had, it just took a while to get this uh, discussion going. To Washington, the back, and back and forth. Well, you know, it finally got approved and implemented or started this spring. So that's uh, six years. Six years of making to pull it off. So during that time, some of the funding got kind of shaved off, and so we had to adjust. But at the same time, still, 15,500 acres is a whole lot more grasslands in those eight parishes than what there is right now. So I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but the Nature Conservancy uh, has... Uh, generated private funds uh, of $750,000 to put towards this very crap. And when you add up the numbers in terms of USDA and also the Office of Soil Water Conservation District, you're talking about almost a 35 to 1 leverage, which is which is pretty pretty powerful. Even though $750,000, that's a lot of money for the Nature Conservancy to kind of have sitting in, in reserve for five years, but uh, we're committed to seeing this this happen. In terms of establishment, co establishment cost, uh, and these are these are what the numbers that uh, the NRCS folks in the, in, have, have come up with in terms of what it's going to take. Now, let me just stop here for a minute because seed availability is a real, real issue. The uh, the, there's been, you know, Dr. Verdrin, a lot of volunteers, Louisiana Native Plant Association, many others that have been working to try to develop uh, seed increase projects for prairie in Louisiana. If everybody wanted to, if we had 15,500 acres signed up in three days, it would be hard to find all that thing of seed. And so we're looking at alternatives and, and uh, one of the alternatives is looking at ways that the conservancy may be able to, if the seed cost is more, let's say coming to Texas. You, some of you have met Bill Neiman here. He owns a, a large company and provides native uh, prairie seed. He's done several projects in Louisiana with Fish and Wildlife Service already at Lacassine. There's a prairie site up there, as well as some other locations. And we've seen some of those initial projects is that it's, it's Generally, it's worked, they've worked pretty well. And so there's a possibility we could bring uh, seed material from the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge, from the uh, University of Houston Coastal Center, maybe even from the Nash Prairie site that we heard about this morning, and be able to apply for this. It may cost more, but the Conservancy would be willing to make up the difference and, and uh, help the landowner. We would rather have that than have a bunch of Alamo switchgrass put out that's not going to create really any habitat benefits. So again, the leverage on this project, we can come up to total project uh, partner contributions to the uh, federal component is, uh, is a pretty power, powerful leverage. The, uh, from the Conservancy's perspective, Here's what I, I mentioned here uh, already as, as a real concern. Obviously, we want to see tracks signed up. We want the total 15,500. We'd love to see another sign up, possibly. But the key is we don't have a uh, 
we don't have really a stepwise solution to what happens after the 15 years. Uh, obviously, commodity prices are high. I'm going to touch on that just in a few more minutes, but that's a real challenge. And trying to provide an economic framework that works for landowners following the end of the contract uh, is going to be key to the long-term success of this project. As I mentioned, all, you know, it's all about people. It's all about what Doug was mentioning this morning in his presentation, his dedication, persistence in terms of making these projects really work. The Louisiana Native Plant Initiative uh, has a whole lot, and you've met some of them today, a very committed and dedicated folks, just like here in Texas, that want to see Coastal Prairie expanded. There's a couple of guys that have really carried the water uh, in terms of keeping Coastal Prairie conservation as a, as a, a major focus for, for Louisiana and keeping this conversation this challenge home. We could easily, everybody could just kind of fold their tent and give up, but that's not in the DNA of these folks. And, and of course, the kids that come out and help uh, work towards it, whether it's a seed increase project, collecting seed from them, these railroad remnants, uh, the folks that Dr. Padrine has had coming through LSU units over the years, working on prairies, constantly getting down in the dirt, doing the work, and, and kind of kind of getting that embedded within their, their outlook on life. It is, is, is really critical, and we're hoping that that's going to help the long-term uh, success of this project. Well, as I mentioned, so where are we at right now? I mentioned commodity prices, all right? So the conversation for CREP started in about 2005 when rice was about as low as it's been in many, many, many years, and so we had this time lag in terms up until spring of this year uh, where we actually had the approval, we had the uh, uh, final agreement signed and, and ready for signing up. Well, a lot's happened since that time in terms of the, uh, the rice market. Rice is going for about double what it was back in 05. And, uh, and that's changed a lot of the attitude of the farmers in the eight parish region. Uh, when in 2005, 2006, talking to the landowners there, they said, yeah, bring us on. We're ready to sign up right now, <laughs> please. And uh, they were ready to go. We never would have pushed this beyond that if we didn't do that homework ahead of time, talking to the, to the, uh, the farming community in those uh, eight parishes. And unfortunately, or fortunately for the farmers, the rice prices have come back. Now, the CREP uh, sign-up is for five years. Uh, commodity prices don't, as you can see here, they don't stay uh, the same for, for very long. So we're committed to this. We hope it works out. But the bottom line is, we don't have any official, we don't have any signed on the dotted line agreements under the CREP right now. Uh, so since it was almost a great concept, great framework, but world prices on rice have kind of uh, change the ball game for us. But it may change the ball game in our favor. Who knows, in the next year or two, we don't know. The Nature Conservancy is committed to keeping you know, our partnership funds in place for this project through duration, and hopefully uh, we're going to see a turnaround. They've had about probably half a dozen uh, producers talking to our FSA uh, partners on this project, some folks very interested in and it, we're going to be doing some more outreach and some workshops this winter, profiling prairie crap, try to keep it in the forefront of the producer's mind in terms of this is another tool, this is another program that you can take advantage of, funding is there, uh, and just see where it goes. Obviously, we can't force anybody to sign up for it. So, I guess in the end, uh, we've got a framework here that I think is, is pretty powerful. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to talk about this, I think for Texas it may have some accountability as well. When you think about some of the places that you know were 
Kirk and Clifford have been working at for years. Victoria County, for example, has a significant brush problem. If you could get enabling uh, funding for prairie prep in, in that part of state, you'd have a whole nother landscape, essentially, to build on the successes in the Refugio Goliath prairie area, for example. There may be some other opportunities around the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. Don't know. So, anyhow, that's my presentation, and uh, I'll be glad to take any any questions. Have y'all looked at trying to put a monetary value on on the carbon sequestration? Exactly how much carbon sequestration that you could uh, maintain every year, and have it as a commodity where you know we're going to make we're going to sequester this much carbon this year. And, and the companies pay, or could that Grant, be 15 year old? Yeah, that's a good question. In, in southern, southern temperate grassland systems, there hasn't been a ton of work in terms of quantifying carbon stores. There's a lot more work up in the prairie pothole region where actually Nature Conservancy working with Ducks Unlimited and other partners quantifying carbon stores in, in northern prairie uh, grasslands. We're working towards trying to get that same work done in, in uh, Louisiana. It, it could be another potential tool because we've, we've pretty well figured, you know, it's all been figured out for, uh, for WRP areas in the Delta. In fact, we just closed on a couple projects in the Delta where what, what we, the situation we had, we had a landowner filed an intention, in this case it was actually CRP, and, and uh, then what we, we worked out was a great where Nature Conservancy would come in on top of that that CRP. Uh, okay, was it a 30 year? No, what CRP? 20. I'm getting mixed up between my WRP and my CRP, but it's a term limited product. So after that, we take the balance of the value for a permanent easement in Louisiana and call them servitudes, quantify that value along with the carbon. And so, on top of the, uh, the the funding they were getting from their CRP, which is about 800, about 800 an acre, we then applied another $500 to purchase a perpetual servitude and the carbon rights for that. And and so the landowner realized a premium on top of the CRP. They weren't interested in really a carbon. There's, carbon is totally voluntary market right now, and it doesn't have much value. You pay about Four dollars and seventy cents per metric ton. What is produced from those trees on that CRP? And so, the landowners, all they're interested in is the recreational hunting aspects of the property. None of that changes. That's all there. So they were able to essentially buy that land without any money coming out of pocket. Long term, they got they got their CRP over the term of the agreement. Now, with the rice production. Uh, these are net numbers, their net earnings have doubled, essentially, is what you're saying? Uh, because diesel's going up and I mean, water's getting... Uh, oh, oh net, no, no. I mean, I see right production costs are going up, it's just like everything so else. But I'm just talking about pure, that graph I showed you, that was just world rice market prices on a uh, uh, tonnage basis there. Of course, normally here we think about a hundred weight category, but the story on that graph I just wanted to point out is that we've got a doubling in world grain prices really across the board. Well, the farmer understands that the cost to produce that rice, even though the price is going up in the market, is costing him more than the price is going up. Oh, yeah. His net profit is zero uh, right. and maybe less. Unfortunately, farmers don't usually think long term. It's always a Especially many of them are runners. Well, many of them, the bank just makes the decision. Uh, sure. Understand. Well, the farmers are having to hang their hindies out, you know, for three times more just to put in a crop. So, you know, there's that much more risk. So they do think about that. Yeah. You know, the bank's thinking about that and the farmer's thinking about that. Well, that's another reason why, you know, of course, finalized all the agreements in April. They had already had their plan, you know. What they're going to do this spring, you got to plan out far enough ahead to get their agreements and get their, uh, you know, get their crop cycle planned out. 
So, like I said, this winter we're going to be trying to hit it hard again in terms of outreach, you know, working with our colleagues with the NRCS and, and try to... Even if you got 100 acres, that would, in my opinion, be a great success. If we get the first sign up, that would be huge. That, yeah, even, yeah, you're right, Malcolm. If it's just 100 acres, if we get one sign up, we can make a lot of hay out of one sign. Then we start the catfish frying, and we get the, you know, we, we have the open houses, and, and we, we really can, can, I think, get a little more traction in the sign-up. But uh, right now, it's uh, been a little slow. <laughs> Um, when you showed us that slide about the cost to establish per acre, it was like $524. Uh, what, was that what the homeowner's cost is, or is that the total cost before you do the cost sharing? That'd be total cost. Okay, so you can do 50 to 100%. Yeah, depending on what specific, yeah. Okay. Assuming there's C. You're looking at five or less species? Is it, did I understand correctly? Well, for the high diversity, high diversity planning, yeah, it's, it's six. Or you can do more, but it's a minimum of six. Where are you getting your plant materials from? Or where are you getting your seed? Well, like I said, that's that's. Because I, I know when I worked there, we were all for NRCS in the early '90s there, and we first started, you know, talking about this. That was in, I don't know how many sample plots we did from, you know, Hammond to Rabel. It was just we were bringing in seed from out of state and just. It yeah. seems like we couldn't get anything to go very well, especially on the coast. It seems. Yeah, that's that's been a big uh, topic of conversation. And you know, and if, that, if there was some money to help uh, local seed growers to propagate and start building a seed base, then when you got that first hundred acres, you could actually have local seed in place. But you need some upfront money to encourage people to grow out plots. Yeah, um, yeah, you're right. And a lot of those conversations happened before I got there. Right. Uh, there's some opportunity, you know, and fortunately... The first one that signs up can make some money because yeah. his plot can become the seed plot. If he can, right. Especially if you can plant his 100 acres or 10 acres, I don't know how much the minimum is, Yeah. with native seeds, then his seed plot would become the source for more seeds, so you have to make money. Is he allowed to harvest his seed and, and sell yeah, it to be your be, program? Well, that's a good question. So you, you want, if you tie uh, in that hands, to RP, you're, you're, there's, there's grazing and haying restrictions. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't fool you much do CRP, seed so I don't know if you can, yeah. I don't know if you can seed. combine seed. That, and can then, you graze and hay all that land under CRP? I doubt it. I don't think yeah, I'll just kind of this is some kind of, like I said, this is a special project. I don't know if they're. Yeah, unless, I mean, the state DC has some latitude, what yeah. they could allow under, you know, certain circumstances. I, like I know when we were trying to, well, we, I went and I didn't work there, but I know when that time when Johanna was on the coast, they were trying to get some WRP going. That was some of the issues. You know, can they graze that or could they use that then to harvest seed? I don't know if they ever resolved yeah, those. Well, that's issues. a whole other conversation. Actually, uh, uh, there's going to be a meeting here in about a week uh, looking at mid term practices for WRP. Because you know, you've got so many stands have taken off. It's just, oh, it's just so dense. You have such high survivals. You look at them, and from a wildlife perspective, it's probably not optimal. It would be good to be able to go in and thin those areas. So there's, there's a lot more conversation. I think more flexibility in the part of. Uh, the state in our CS, you know, because they understand it better than anybody uh, how to improve the practices. So for grassland and, and the seed issue, uh, my understanding is that there was a, a, a big push at ULL uh, to work on uh, trying to get the beginnings of the seed increase project going. And then it just it hasn't reached the level that it needs to for lack of funding. Had somebody working on it. Uh, you know, obviously Larry was basically volunteering all his time on that, and it's just sort of evaporating. That doesn't mean that we couldn't make another run at something like that, but there's got to be just exactly what you said, at least a supply there. And I, and I think we have the latitude to bring in some Texas plant material, which has shown it can work. Uh, there's problems. But it's going to be cost more. It's going to cost more. We lost a lot of those plants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
But it run into you and it's, it's done to waste a lot of money and time. But then again, if you get, like you said, if you get the first hundred acres, on it, I think people start saying, well, you know, you look at it from a uh, business perspective and say, all right, well, there's some the, money providing local ground plant material, you know, let's do it. Well, uh, kind of along those same lines, for smaller tracks, did you guys investigate the possibility of using live plugs, like small plugs, if it was, you know, say a five acre or something like that? Is that probably Not that I know of. Not yeah. for that price. Yeah. It's cost prohibitive at that point. Oh, yeah. If you look at the success, though, you know. That's what I was thinking. That was good. Versus, you know, almost guaranteed success. Yeah. But yeah. You, an acre of plugging it, I mean, we're talking this serious. Well, one of the things is we talk about trying to use some of those remnant tracks that are on private land, for the most part, as sort of a core. And you sort of, you know, think about them as a potential seed source for their neighbors and, and so on. And I don't think that's been explored probably as, as deeply as maybe it could. Maybe there's some way to, you know, deploy some conservation innovation grant funding yeah. or something to put in and show you know, create a business plan where you can show a landowner and say, you know what, you could do this and you can make some money on this track that right now you're probably not getting a whole lot of return on. Well, I know our plant material centers have, you know, portable combines and maybe working with established seed companies, maybe through conservation districts or grants or nature conservancy, you could get, that'd be a way to target some seed harvesting. Right, right. And, you know, Bill Neiman has volunteered to come over with his combine and actually harvest some of those remnants. You know, we haven't thought through it. And that would be something that I think I could, then our conservancy folks say, you know what, we put a little bit of money out towards this, it could make a difference. Yeah, Maybe not the 15000 they money out to get it, get the ball rolling. Right. They need Build some upfront money because this, you're starting below, below the level for normal, right? So, you can't promise the former any kind of benefit. You can't even promise them you can get the seed, and, and you can't. Well, they can talk promise them. benefit on the seventy-seven dollars. You know, if they're getting a one and a half times the rental rate, that's something. But yeah, I understand what you're saying in terms of they, if they can't follow through on the practices that they're signing an agreement with FSA on that they're going to do these things, and that if they don't have a seed, you know, they're going to be saying, "Yeah, I'm signing something that I'm putting myself in a no-win situation." But I tell you what, we can get that local ground seed, and there's some available, but we don't want to have to go to Kansas to bring seed into these, these, these sites. And I have a sense that in Texas, people in Texas are going to want their seed big time. As it continues to dry down, yeah. they, they, Texas is really going to get excited about planting. Mm -hmm. Well, the grasses. problem you're going to have like this year is nobody's growing seed anywhere. I mean, the whole state's in the drought. So if Louisiana was counting on getting seed harvest from Louisiana this year, you can forget about it. So you're looking at a whole other growing season. Here, hopefully, we'll have seed next growing season. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this, this spring, you and know, then, so that demand builds up. So This spring, you know, I talked to Bill, he had a whole barn full because he had an yeah, optimal had a harvest yeah. last year. You got, I don't know what the numbers were, they were pretty incredible from uh, Atwater Prairie Chicken uh, Refuge and also the Coastal Center, and there was one other place, he said he can't find no places for us, but I'm sure that's all, he probably has that depleted by now, maybe. But uh, anyhow, it's a good framework, you know, and if you can get uh, Kirk and the Nature Conservancy in Texas to get, you know, a couple million dollars lined up, yeah. get down to Victoria, <laughs> I tell you, you oh, went to the grant class. Okay, yeah. Well, I don't know. Grant class. You know, I think I think something we need to think about is, is in your situation, if you could get VP money, you know, or something like that to start yeah. the ball rolling and, and offer it to them as like carbon credits, where they take on the whole project and set it up, and you subsidize it, maybe. But if you could get you know, some of these companies that are willing to try to go that direction anyway. Right. To, I mean, the private's the only way to go for the next how many years? You know, for us in Texas, we're going to have to start hitting, uh, for restoration, all these oil companies that are dividing up all the land over in the Eagleford Shell and, and show them, look, you're screwing it up. 
and then the landowners are going to have to start saying, we're not going to sign a lease unless you're going to put restoration into effect. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to drive the need for seed source. Because once an oil field start has to pay for it, then you can actually, it's like Clifford trying to get a piece of equipment. And even if he could get a piece of equipment, it's going to be, you know, $175 an hour as opposed to $100 an hour because of the demand. So. Yeah, you know, on, on the BP stuff here, unfortunately, if they put a spill on uh, some of that rice country, you know, we might be able to get some right. rice. <laughs> you never know, it's a bit of feet and cranes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, hey, you know, like I said, we committed this. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna work as hard as we can to make this thing work. Because I think it's a great program. I think the USDA has, has done a great job, kind of showing flexibility and getting this thing. Of course, they took a little while to kind of run through the wheels of the legal, uh, all the you know, TNC attorneys and the USDA attorneys and all that. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, Hope to see some good sign, but you know, if because originally on this project, TNC was willing to commit two million dollars to it, and then it just kind of got diluted over time. But you know, if a small program, and I'm talking about conservancy here, a small program in Louisiana can step up and you know, for two million, there's a lot of groundswell <laughs> just from grassroots. Let's you know, coin a phrase here, but it's. Something that's growing and just by popular uh, popularity and what's growing. Yeah. It's uh it's just getting the word out, I think. You'd have interest this year considering that there may be rice farmers next year that may or may not plant because they're getting their water turned off. That's the whole yeah, the whole water. So, the, point, right? I mean, so the whole water next year. Colorado River Authority, Brazos River Authority, all these you may not be you know, able to some of these guys may yeah. not have any rice. You know, we may not have any rice in Texas or in Clarkson, Texas. It has nothing to do with prices or anything. Yeah, it's that's just they're not going to get the water. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a real good point. Because then what are they going to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. with that, without water, it's not going to be risky trying to switch to soybeans or Milo or right. or any of that other stuff. Otherwise, well, thanks guys for hanging out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we've got to give it to these guys who sat through them, <laughs> and they survived. Congratulations <laughs> on your award. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never oh, seen it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when you were talking about, what, Covington? Or, uh, oh, well, you said it. Some of your products. I see. How many times? Well, in fact, the zoo is actually
But it wouldn't be just five or six species. You, you can mean, sit and one, see that kind of they have yeah. 20, 30, 40, 50 species. You mean like on their own property? You know, or, or stored up. I mean, I don't know. You know people who are collecting bird seed, they're not just collecting a few species. They're right. collecting and yeah, that's a minimum. Yeah. That's just a minimum. They're almost collecting. It's kind of making it. Or they should hate. You know, they they yeah. come to my property and hate. Yeah. That's just making it easy for them. Land. So they get a yeah, they get a supply of pet. Yeah, yeah. Two hundred fifty species in my front yard. Document practically. So they're not all right at the same time. Six species in front. Six species represented there. Right. Yeah. Some of those are annuals, right? Well, there's you. I mean, that's the point. The way I understand it, so. You've got, because you've just said something about 2,000 pounds of seed or a couple thousand pounds of seed. And I know, I mean, just from what I collected this year and what I have left over from last year, I've been sitting on six, seven hundred pounds of seed, high diversity seed, and, you know, local genetics. And I've got a neighbor who's got uh, several hundred pounds. A couple hundred He's been pounds. finding prairie in his, in his, his fields uh, five, six years. And then when you've got seed, and I'm there's another fellow, um, David Daigle, who has. Oh a, yeah. David. So, so David's collecting. And he's collecting in the, uh, in the savannah. So well, it's the prior to the long, long leaf uh, savannah. Yes, but yeah. that the yeah. genetics there is quite similar to the prairie. I mean, the same. That's one of the contiguous mm -hmm. grassland. Yeah. yeah. As you yeah, know, have no idea. That's like trees, like red yeah. beets, carrots, yeah. yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and all the way to Charles. All, all the way up to okay. All right. And all that was one big grassland. In fact, we were at the paper yeah. the North American Prairie Conference last uh, the last conference. The guy from Florida said literally the genetics from Florida to the top, where we have the uh, lonely pine forest mm -hmm. all the way across, hopping the city over here. It's quite similar. It's all basically mm -hmm. one coastal prairie. Mm -hmm. so, as you get out of Texas into Louisiana, you start getting the lonely pine, and then you jump up. And you've got a few prairies in Mississippi, Alabama, right. and that lonely pine forest all the way to the Carolinas, then Florida. And all that grass, all that is coastal see. prairie oh. grasses. You see? Mm -hmm. Just when you remove all the trees, you can say, ah, that's prairie. Mm -hmm. yeah. But ecologically, the lonely pine forest functions essentially like a prairie. Hmm. But with the added bonus of these that extra species that we're always talking about. Yeah. So that's what we're saying. We haven't expanded our thinking like that yet, mm -hmm. except these people that are the cutting edge, that they're mm -hmm. expanding their thinking like that. But I, I think Peter Lewis has been thinking like that for a long time. Oh, so yeah, well. Lonely fine, just prairie with these prairie long 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 trees. <laughs> <laughs> and, or, you know. The prairie is just missing a species as long as we yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it's essentially the same type yeah. of species so, of grass. So that changes your, your whole perspective when you say in Louisiana we only got those few little spots left. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. And, yeah. and, and you, as soon as you get out yeah. into that long leaf pine, you say, no, wait a minute, I'm talking about plants with basically yeah. the, the same genetics. So, species so then we're in a different game now. Okay? So I don't have to just harvest seed rather than from Texas, I can harvest it and lonely pine and bring that down and plant it in a prairie. Mm -hmm. my, my parents live in that part of the state and you, you see a lot of native grasses in that area, forest well, hill. And what do you think about that? When you go to harvest, you, you can expand your harvesting concept to lonely pine. Well, I think the, there may be a species or three or whatever that are found in the prairie that are found in the pine if you delineate them as crisply as you Well, if you want. bring stuff in from Texas, you bring in more than two or three species. And and that's what I'm thinking. You bring yeah, I would much rather see harvesting from Savannah, Louisiana, or local Savannah type landscape, a lonely farm. than going to Texas to get stuff that's getting much less rainfall, much less adaptability, I think. Uh, when you look, read this wonderful book called Looking for Lonely. Hmm. And I'll give you guys a copy of my book. Oh, you the truck? Yeah. In the van. I'll give you guys a copy of cited in that book. It's a book called Looking for Lonely, written by the guy who, who studied the ecology of Lonely Pine. And, and his descriptions and, and his attitude toward fire and the way it relates to prayer is just so 
Is that a is that a recent book? Yes. Yeah, okay. No more than five years. Okay. Because I read it. You mentioned that book. I got it mm -hmm. online. Look at it for like three dollars. Yeah. I'm looking for a really? long. Really? Yeah. It's great. But looking for a long. Mm -hmm. Is that Louisiana author? No, no. Okay. Actually, Caroline, as I'll say. What well, spent some time in what love we spent? No, 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 yeah, you know, I'm talking to the folks. Yeah, I saw that. Oh, really? You've been wanting to go see some of his yeah. restoration work. Right. 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 Uh, I, will, I will, I will. I, I, you know, uh, two years ago, I collected uh, like a record amount of seed for me. It was 800 pounds. I thought I'd done a miracle. You know, sold all of that seed, and then last year, I hardly had any seed sales. This year, the same thing. I got you know a couple hundred pounds or something. Yeah, but I want to okay. that part. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh, so. Well, good. So this is what it's all about: making contacts. Well, you know, yeah. Things. Maybe we'll get you know, have a fine line there. Watch up yet with the NCS folks that come on be talking to them pretty quick. Maybe you'd be open to maybe talk to landlords uh, at a workshop like that. Sure. Uh, like you said, we should have fried the catfish and they'll come. <laughs> I can help you there. I've been in Louisiana long enough to know that, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, food talks. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, my name is Jason Stagg, I'm a graduate student at uh, LSU, and I'm trying to think, I think my professor may have emailed.